Hi, Dr. Cecil Foster. I'm so excited to have you here with me today. It is such an honor. I know how privileged I am to have you on Our Africa. Dr. Foster was my co-supervisor at the master's level and the only Black professor and mentor I've had uh, since my 20 years in Canada. Dr. Foster is currently a professor of sociology at the University of Buffalo in the US. He's a renowned novelist. He's, I just, I'm just so excited <laughs> to have him here with, with me today. I call him the guru of race relations in Canada. So thank you for joining me, Cecil. And I know you're a great storyteller. So I'm going to let you tell your own story, who you are and what you do. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. And you too are a wonderful storyteller. And that is one of the things that I liked about you when I first met you as a MAS student and um, the stories that you told me as well about growing up in Nigeria and about your dad and uh, your religious upbringing and then your transition into North America. So you told me many stories as well that stayed with me. And of course, you introduced me to the great pepper soup, which I <laughs> discovered wasn't quite the same kind of pepper as I had enjoyed in the in, in the Caribbean, and uh, <laughs> but it was lovely pepper soup from what my wife told me because she managed it. But um, I um, was born in Barbados and uh, grew up in Barbados, um, went to secondary school, um, pre-university in Barbados. Then I went to Jamaica and uh, did some studies in mass communication in Jamaica, went back to Barbados. And I had been working as a journalist and a reporter in Barbados all that time, working for the Caribbean News Agency. And then I left Barbados and they came to Canada and um, was one of the first and fortunate ones to break into journalism in Canada. When I arrived in Canada, there were very few or almost none um, who were black journalists in Canada. And uh, I ended up uh, working at such places as the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the Financial Post, um, CBC, both radio and television. And I at one point had my own talk show on CFRB. But when I talk about the early days of journalism, um, very often I went into newsrooms and I was the very first and the only black in that newsroom. And now I can look back and I can see that many um, Black and immigrant people have managed to get into the profession and are doing quite well. And I am very pleased about that. And that was one of the areas that I um, put my efforts into. A second one was I got into doing public intellectual work that is um, speaking on issues of race and ethnicity and multiculturalism and things like that. To some extent, holding the country accountable um, saying um, if you are indeed promising to uh, produce a society that is truly multicultural, it should be for all peoples, especially for black people who from the very beginning of the notion of a Canada, just like the First Nations people, were always marginalized. So I was always in the forefront saying, no, um, a multicultural society should be one in which all peoples have the same chance and the same opportunities. And I did that not only in um, journalism, not only in speaking, but also in writing uh, some books that have been fairly well taken up and books that are fiction and some books that are general interest. And of course, I then made a third stop where I went in fully into academia and uh, um, completed my um, PhD and uh, my doctorate. And now I'm at um, the University at Buffalo, which is just across the water, across the border from Toronto. And I maintain links between Toronto and Buffalo. Thank you so much. You are the voice for the voiceless. And I'm sure your work has made life a lot better for me as a Black person in Canada. You published a book, I guess, in 1996. 
a place called heaven. And I remember you gave me a copy of that book. I've held on to it <laughs> closely. So the meaning of being black in Canada. It was quite an eye opener for me. It's about the struggles of race relations in Canada. So what made you write that book? And when you look back now, how is the race relations in Canada from the time you wrote the book until where we are right now in Canada? Well, that book, uh, A Place Called Heaven, uh, came out in the 1990s. And uh, it was at a very pivotal point in the recognition of Black life in Canada. I mean, until then, much of the narrative about Blacks in Canada was that Blacks could not survive in Canada, that Canada was never intended for Black people. And even when I was growing up in Barbados in the Caribbean, there was the stories that Canada was really for white people. But yet, that wasn't quite true. There were always um, Black people living in Canada. And certainly, in the 1990s, there would have been Black people in the country for 300 years or more. Yet, they were not living the Canadian experience. They were not living the good life. And uh, on top of that, we were going through a backlash period where there were some newspapers and some of the politicians, certainly from out of Western Canada and the Reform Party and others, had taken very anti-Black attitudes. And uh, they were calling for the deportations of Blacks. There were skirmishes between Blacks and the police. And there was the suggestion that Blacks were contributing nothing to Canada. So when I wrote that book, I wrote it against that backdrop of saying, one, that Blacks have always been very central to the Canadian experience. Two, it is not true that Blacks are all the proverbial bad apples. There are many of them that are making great contributions. And at that time, where we really saw those contributions was in athletics, where Canada was going to the Olympics and it was Black athletes that were flying the flag. It was also at the same time when the Blue Jays were winning back-to-back -back World Series in North American baseball, and the Blue Jays teams were essentially Black teams. The, the manager of that uh, uh, successful team was a Black man, Cito Gaston. And I went through and I was pointing out that it was not fair to Blacks to paint them in such a negative um, way. But I also wanted to do something else. I also want to produce a book that offer inspirations to the generation at that time, but to future generations, to talk about the possibility that maybe someday Canada would become a place where Black people and people of Indian ancestry and Filipinos and others, that they would imagine themselves becoming attorney generals and becoming premiers and becoming prime ministers. And at that time, everybody thought that I was just crazy, that that, that, that was just not Canadian. And I was saying, no, we have to start thinking that non-white people can become the leaders of this country. And then subsequent to that, we had um, two black women that were made um, governor general and lieutenant governor of Nova Scotia. We had a black man that was made a lieutenant governor of um, uh, Ontario. And since then there were others. But at that time, people thought that I was just way out there. But that's what I was imagining. So in choosing the title, A Place Called Heaven, I was appealing to history because during the slavery in the United States, um, when there was the Underground Railroad where people would escape from Southern slavery into places like Buffalo and elsewhere and then make their way into Canada, um, the code word that the slaves use among themselves when they're about to run away was they often said they were going to Canada. So mm -hmm. Canada, was really that place that they call heaven. I'm sorry, they would say they're going to, they're, not they're going to Canada, they're going to heaven. And very often, often the, the slave owners and others thought they were 
thinking about dying or something else, but Canada was the code word, or heaven was the code word for Canada. So Martin Luther King had come to Canada and had given a speech and he referred to that. So I took that out of Martin Luther King's uh, speech, a place called heaven. And then the subsequent part of the title was the meaning of being black in Canada. And I wanted to give that sort of wholesome notion of what it is to be black in Canada. And uh, looking forward, uh, I'm jumping forward to today, I see that since then there are many other writers who have followed and who have written similar books or subsequent books on being black in Canada or being black and white in Canada or being whatever. But at that time, that book really established the notion of what it is to exist in this country as a person who is black. Thank you so much for not giving up when people thought you were crazy, when you were professing good things for black people. So what do you think about the race relations currently? What's your opinion on that? How is the race relations in Canada today? I think that race relations have improved, but at the same time, they still have a long way to go. Um, it would be silly of me to say that 20 or 30 years later that there has been no improvement. Because as I said, when I came to Canada, you could not get a job as a, a journalist. You could, you were going to banks and elsewhere, you hardly saw anyone that was black. So and what year was this, Cecil? What year? When you so came to I, I, I came to Canada in 1979. So 79 and in the 80s 80. and in the first part of the 90s, we were still kept out institutionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw very few black people who went to grad school as graduate students. There were very few who got mm. to be professors. And if they did, invariably, they probably went to Britain and then came back to, um, and then came to Canada. But there were very few native people or indigenous people that were um, coming through the pipelines. And I use that word advisedly because uh, it certainly wasn't the case that our First Nation people were, were involved in anyway. They were absolutely marginalized and left out of society. And I remember one of the first pieces that I wrote about was about what was happening to the First Nations people in Montreal at that time, uh, something that was called the Oka Crisis when the army went in to suppress um, the First Nations people who were simply trying to retain title and control over a cemetery in which they wanted um, to turn into a golf course. And uh, the First Nation people uh, pushed back against that. And I wrote about that as well in a pamphlet that was called um, Canada's Racist Face. Um, and uh, so that was the reality then. But at the same time, we are seeing Black faces and Black people and people of all different ethnicities beginning to rise through the system. But I still think that there's a lot of work that is left to be done. I am still waiting to see a Black Prime Minister. I'm still waiting to see a Black Premier. I am still waiting to see maybe a Asian premier and prime minister, and, and all of those things that still need to be done to really send the message that Canada is, and this is a term that I have coined and I have used, that Canada is genuinely multicultural, not only multicultural in theory, but in actually in power, that non-white people can have power relationships in Canada, that they can be the CEOs, that they can also be the people at the bottom, but that they have the option of becoming anything that human dignity allows us to aspire to or want to be. So that if as human beings, we have an infinity of possibilities that should be open as well to all people, regardless of the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their language spoken, whatever. 
And if Canada is going to be genuinely multicultural, we have to be able to do that. My grandkids should be able now to believe that they can become anything they want to be. And I'm not saying that to be glib, but I'm saying that in a real sense that it can become something that is actual. And that to suggest that my grandkids or my great grandkids should they be would be limited to certain jobs or certain positions would become such an anatomy of what Canada is that it would not even be conceivable, that people would not even think about it. And that is one of the good things that I think that Canada offers the world, that possibility that it can really be that place that allows people to become genuinely human. That is live out their human experiences without society or any group of people preventing any one person from becoming what she, it, or they want to be because of some stereotypical notion of what they ought to be. Thank you so much. Certainly a great way to look at things. I like the idea of elders in indigenous communities. I don't know if we have elders in the black communities. I do think we might have elders, but elders of a different sort. The problem that we might have as black people in Canada is that very few of us get to live out our ethnicity. We get to live out our racialization so that and, and we tend to think of elders as people who are the wise people, the, the knowledge holders, the mentors in our ethnicity. Um, so if you are Yoruba, you know your elders that come up through that. But you come to um, Canada and uh, someone like me um, who is from a different region and maybe a different socialization become the supposed elder to you. But we don't have those same links and those same cultural links. And I think that that is the big difference that where you have the First Nation peoples, they are grounded in their traditions. Sometimes one tradition, each nation has its traditions. Whereas for those of us, Blacks who come to Canada, we had to start our traditions all over again. We had to rally and we had to take a bit from here, a bit from there, and uh, come together and coalesce. But we still produce elders of sorts. So for example, in my last book, They Call Me George, um, the untold story of the making of modern Canada, um, of course, I always get the name wrong, but they call me George, uh, is the short title. Um, you'll see that there were elders. There were Black people from the Caribbean, from Africa, from elsewhere, who came together and formed fraternal associations. They, got, they came together in unions. They came together in various Black associations. And out of that, you got the leadership. And they advocated for changes. And they advocated for changes that were along a racial ethnic line rather than for a specific group. So they didn't advocate for Jamaicans or for Barbadians or for Nigerians or for Ugandans. They advocated as a group. So it was kind of a coalition. So our elders tend to be coalition based. And, uh, and therefore, their mandate tend to be much wider than the, a sing, the single nature. But at the same time, it might not map on neatly to the kind of elders that I would have come up with in Barbados, or that you would have met in Nigeria, or that we would see our First Nation brothers and sisters have here, because ours were so fragmented. We had to come out of that fragmentation. And indeed, that's the story of the African experience in the New World, the fragmentation that happened through um, transatlantic in enslavement. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, first of all, deracinated all of us, take away our 
culture and our memory and our identities and took away our ethnicities from us and in turn gave us a racial identity which was black and a racial identity meant then that within that category we then had to start building our own institutions so we didn't build elders as an institution the same way that it was done elsewhere i think we built it in a way that was suited to the environment that was north america that's good to know so you mentioned your book they call me george about portals in canada so i read the um summary of the book and it is quite um, distressing when you realize that every black porter was called George. Well, let's start with the fact that every porter was called George. Um, and that is so typical of a continuation of the enslavement experience. Now, the, the story of these porters be, began just after the ending of slavery in North America in the 1870s when the railroads are linking the Pacific to the Atlantic and various places. And it became the norm of business and traveling across North America. And this is the heyday of the railroad barons and others like that. And uh, a man named George Pullman came up with the very good idea that if he can um, offer a kind of service to travelers, going across the continent that made it appear as if the passengers were visiting a southern home, a mansion in the south, an antebellum home, while they are traveling. And they had people that looked after them and catered to their whims and fancy, turn up their beds at night, polish their shoes, clean the spittoons, um, bring them their beverages, and called them sir and madam, and was very differential to them, never spoke to them directly, and uh, relied primarily for payment on the gratuities that they would offer. And he provided that service. And where did he go to get his first set of um, people to do that kind of work? He went into the South and he picked the best that he could find among the former enslaved people who at that time could find no work and were happy just to be able to work for tips. And they also went into the Caribbean and bring out people from the Caribbean as well. So that by the turn of the 1900s, as the railways are really blooming and um, they're the primary form of trans Petition, the sleeping car porters are the backbone of the passenger service. And the sleeping car porters are in fact the forerunners of what we now call flight attendants on airlines and things like that. Except that at that time, starting from about the beginning of the 1900s, if you wanted to be a porter, you had to be black because no one else would do those demeaning jobs. And secondly, if you were a porter on the railroad, you could get no other job on the railroad because black people could not become engineers or firemen or anything that was deemed to be operational. So it became a dead end job. Mm -hmm. Those few who got the job I had to walk a very fine line because the slightest infringement of the norms will cause them to lose their jobs. And very often, those were the only jobs that were available in the Black community. So mm. as a result, you have some of the highest educated mm. Black people working in these demeaning jobs. And in fact, it was taking Black men, turning them into domestic workers which was the norm of the day, because at that time, porters also were the kind of people that would take your luggage from the train station to the hotel, 
They'll be the ones that will be opening the doors for you. They'll be the ones that will help you up through the elevators. All of those jobs were portering jobs. And, and then you just, as you know, the one thing about those jobs was that they weren't well paid and they were for men. And uh, so by the turn of the 1900s, only black men are doing these jobs. And uh, once you start these jobs, you could not move on to any other job, either on the railway or outside of the railway. So by the 1940s, jumping ahead after the Second World War, and after blacks had, black people had fought in all over the world for freedom, we know what happened, the rise of the civil rights movement in North America, coinciding with the fight for independence in Africa, the fight for independence in the Caribbean. So you have a Pan-Africanist black uprising. And, and we saw this, for example, as I relate in the book, specifically in Canada, where you had black men from primarily from the Caribbean and elsewhere saying, the system that operates in Canada cannot go on forever. For example, at that time, um, even black British subjects could not get into Canada. And at that time, Canada was supposedly fully British, and anyone who was a British subject could literally walk into Canada. But if you are a Black British subject, if you are a Black British subject from Lagos, or from Accra, or from Bridgetown, or wherever, you could not get into Canada. Also, if you were a Black person in the United States, you could not get into Canada because Canada was a white man's country. And the porters um, advocated against that. And in 1954, a group of them forming themselves as the Negro Citizen Association, but they're fronting for the porters, um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. They went to Ottawa and they met with the Canadian government. And they said, look, all of this is wrong. Mm. We have black soldiers who have died in the war for freedom. We have the mothers of these black soldiers here and they cannot bring up their sons and their grandkids from the Caribbean and elsewhere to join them. This cannot be. And this was at a time when the Canadian immigration allowed in about 250 people from India a year, 250 from Pakistan a year, about 50 from what is now Sri Lanka, but was called Ceylon at that time, and just about 200 or so a year from the Caribbean. So in essence, the annual intake of, um, of, of immigrants from the rest of the British Empire, of which Canada was a, a, a main part, was less than 10,000. There were so few. So they went to Ottawa and they argued for a different type of immigration policy that will allow people who are of merit to come into Canada. And the example that they used for that was domestic workers, female workers who would come in and work in the homes and they'll be well-trained. But that is the beginning of the points system that Canada now operates, where if anybody anywhere in the world can apply to come to Canada and they will be judged on a point system, 10 points, or if you speak with the language, well, it might be more than 10, but various numbers. And if you get a specific number, you, you, you are allowed in. But the porters came up with that system. And the porters also fought for such things like fair employment practices and fair housing practices, and uh, to ensure that employees get uh, recognized. They also argue for equal pay for men and women. They also argue for the recognition of the right of First Nations people. So that is my contention that when we look back and to see what they did as a political force in the 1950s into the 1960s, you see them laying the groundwork philosophically mm -hmm 
for what would then become the theory and the ideology of multiculturalism, that after multiculturalism became the practice that we see the changes in immigration, that we see the changes in citizenship, who can become a citizen. And they laid the foundation. And that's why I argue that the idea of a multicultural Canada, of a Canada where all people the world over can live in peace and prosper, um, really came out of the thinking of those um, porters in the 1950s. Wow, thanks to the porters. I'm guessing that was why it was easy for my dad to come through Canada on his way to Stanford. And you know, and that was the norm because people from Africa and the, the, the southern part of Africa, in fact, there's another way to look at it. The building of the railway systems in Africa can be tied to the building of the railway systems in Canada. Mm. And that many of the people who work for CP Rail and then work for Canadian National Rail then went to Africa and they built the Ugandan railway and the Nigerian railway and the railway that go from Mozambique into South Africa. And in return, very often when people were coming out of the African continent, they would use those railroads, come to the ports, get onto a CP ship, or one of those ships and come over to Montreal, link up with CP rail, and then fan out across North America. So your dad most likely did that. And I'm sure if you, if his memory because he might have even traveled on, if not a CP ship, he might have traveled on a British ship, but it was most likely out of Canada. So you see bits of that in terms of what, what they did to your family and to black people in Africa, they did to the native people in North America, America. right? And in fact, the railways were not intended for First Nations peoples. They were intended for the people who are traveling on business and they were primarily white. And quite a number of them were the whites who went on to build South Africa. Because mm -hmm. remember that the apartheid system in South Africa is a direct descendant from the Indian Act here in Canada. It's a direct descendant. And in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, the South Africans were coming to Canada and studying the reservation system under the Indian Act, and which they then went back to South Africa and established the homelands. And of course, we know that the ANC and others fought against the idea of the homelands and the reservations, but that's exactly what they were doing. And the railway was very central to that narrative. Oh. So the portals really impacted all of our lives one way or the other. That man I mentioned, George Holman, who set up that service, set it up first in the United States, where it was black men who simply did the portering, whether it is carrying food, carrying sandwiches, carrying coffee, carrying cigarettes, whatever, and taking care. And he set up that service whereby he would franchise it out to any railroad that wanted. So he just put together these cars and he hired the men. And that's why they were all called George because at that time, nobody bothered to call them by their names. They were simply referred to as George's boy. And we know that how derogatory the name boy is when used for um, black men. So with time, they got to be called George. So everybody on, 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 on the, the, the train was simply say, hey, George, can you bring me some cigarettes? Hey, George, can you turn down? And it might be 10 different people that they're talking to, and they all called them by the same thing. And, uh, and the porters actually hated it because it meant that they, that they had no individuation. They had, and we all know the pride that we have in our names. 
and, yeah. and uh, oh, yeah. the fact that our parents take and name yeah. and all of this, and for all of us to be called George. But what happened um, was that when the service started in Canada, Pullman franchise or offered his service to CP Rail, which was the private sector rail. So in fact, when people talk about Pullman services in Canada, they're talking about CP rails per mm -hmm. se. But the National Railway, which is Canadian National, in competition with CP, they ripped off the service and formed the service on their own, patterned it exactly on what was happening and uh, got the black porters to do the same job. And that was on CN Rail. Mm. But mm. in terms of the servicing um, and uh, feeding and uh, turning up the beds and whatever, it would have been equally black men in the United States or in Canada. So Canada is a mosaic nation, but how can we find unity in diversity? Because I think that unity has to be organic, if I might use that term, in that it must be something that we aspire to be. Unity doesn't have to mean sameness. It, has, it might mean that we all are committed to the same thing. And that is why it is important when we talk about multicultural values or Canadian values, that when you and I and someone else with a different experience, a different age, a different sexuality, different whatever, have those differences and we recognize that we are different, but at the same time, we say there are certain things that are good for all of us. And we don't have to go and reinvent the wheel to know what is good for us. We know the human rights, that human rights have argued for the longest time what is good for all human beings. We know things about human dignity. And we know that what is true about human dignity is that all religions have some concept of it in general. So we have this idea that there is something that makes us human and there's something that fills us with potential and that we should go out and achieve those potentials. That is where I think that multiculturalism and that's where the mosaic and different things come into play, the values that it instilled in us. So that my value that thou should not commit murder does not change if I am white, if I am black, if I am of any other complexion or if I'm of any age. So then this is one of the difficulties that I often have, uh, even in discussing the book, they're calling me George, where people would say to me, but you're talking about Prime Minister Laurie and, 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 and others, um, and other prime ministers, but there were men of their time. And, um, and that argument doesn't carry any sway with me because my argument is that there were men who were powerful in their time because in their time, they had people who were saying, the things that you are doing, mm -hmm. those things aren't right. You are hurting people. You are depriving people of their humanity. And yet they persisted. So it didn't have anything to do with the time because values haven't changed. What is genocide hasn't changed in the last 300 years. What is social acceptability and uh, social cohesiveness has not changed. All that we have done is to broaden the envelope to make sure that those things cover more people. And that's my argument. It is not something that is limited to a specific time or place. It is a value. It is something that you hold there. It's something that we can pass on to our kids and our kids can pass on to their kids so that it doesn't have anything to do at the end of it with the color of our skin or the language we speak or the religion we have, but it is about what we believe is the totality of what it is to be human. And talking about kids, my son who was born here in Canada and now in third year of university has never had a black teacher. 
Am I unreasonable to be concerned about that? No, I think you should be concerned about that. Because um, while I say that um, we don't want sameness, we also want to take pride in the differences that we have. Because we as individuals and as members of different groups take pride in our history and the things that we have achieved. And also some of the inspiration that we get usually come from the people who are very closest to us. Um, when you hear your grandmother and your grandfather and your aunts and uncles talking about the first doctor in the family, the first lawyer, the first whatever, and that gives you the kind of inspiration that you have or when you get it in your community or when your parents, friends come home and they're joking and talking about life or if you go into the mosque or the synagogue or the church, those things are important. They are basic. Schools are important. And schools is where we teach much of the values that I was just talking about that we should have in common. And if we allow certain groups to give the feeling that only they themselves can teach these values, or only they themselves understand these values, then we'll be shortchanging a segment of humanity. The other side of it, if we have young boys and girls in classrooms where they don't see reflections of themselves, where they don't say, well, I can become like him or even better than him, and this is someone who is like me and someone who in, in, in whose footsteps I'll be following because there is a commonality between them and my grandparents and my great grandparents and, uh, and, and I identify with them. If we don't offer that in the classroom and elsewhere, we are again shortchanging a segment of the society. And for the society then to really get a full picture, it should have people of all groups teaching. So therefore, and, and I see this too, I, I teach in the United States and at the University at Buffalo, I've gone into situations with uh, the Black Students Union where they would begin the meeting and there are about 30 or 40 of them in attendance and uh, the vice president would say, uh, to make a point, how many of us have had um, a black teacher? And you look around and you'll see maybe three, four hands go up in the air. So it is an issue of great concern in all North America because we need those mentors. We need those people to be inspiring and we need to let our kids know that they don't always have to be the first, but they can be the one who goes furthest, oh. that they can build on the first, the things that the first people have achieved and they can keep building and they can keep building and they can keep building. They don't always have to start at the starting position. And those are the messages that are lost when our kids don't see people like us in the classroom or, yeah. in, police, or in police departments or in business offices or in politics or in wherever. That's why we need to have representation of all peoples in all walks and facets of life. I still remember the first time I saw you on campus. I had to hold myself back not to jump. <laughs> I was so excited. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so what's it like to be black in academia? And I know you've experienced both like in the US, Canada. I haven't reflected deeply on that question in that specific way, but my first reaction is that there isn't much difference. Hmm. Race is race and racism is racism. And that it is equally difficult to be an academic, a professor on either side of the border. Because the issues that I see being raised in Canada are the same issues being raised in the United States, questions of inclusivity, questions of excellence, questions of diversity, and they're all the same. Um, 
you gave the example of you being at the University of Guelph and saying me, and at that time there might have been three or four other um, black professors across the entire system at, um, at Guelph. And, um, and you and others from Nigeria, I had, I must say that one of my experience of being at Guelph is that I got to meet some wonderful Nigerian students um, um, who had been very successful. And I, I'm very proud that I, in some way, touched their lives. But they were, they were and are excellent students. And, uh, but, but this is the one thing that they told me, and, and they gravitated towards me too, because to some extent, there were no other um, black faces that they um, could relate to. So the experiences for me, whether in Canada or in the, the United States, have not been very different. Mm. Um, maybe sometimes I talk too much, maybe sometimes I do too much advocacy, but I find that I do as much advocacy at the university at Buffalo as I did when I was at the University of Guelph. Why is there distrust between Black communities and establishments? And I say this in light of vaccine hesitancy in the Black communities. Why do you, what's driving that mistrust? The mistrust comes from that systemic racism that has always been there. Um, the systemic racism damaged everyone. Damaged the white society, damaged the non-white um, societies and communities, so that there was never a period when we trusted one another. Right now in Canada, we are talking about reconciliation, but reconciliation is proving very difficult because reconciliation has to first start with the notion that there's been a lot of harm that has been done. And there are still a number of politicians and others who are going around saying there wasn't really any harm and any hurt done. And you cannot get beyond that unless you first acknowledge that, yes, there was harm done. So we spent a lot of time, generation after generation, telling the stories of the harm rather than saying it is time now to move on towards repairing, towards maybe creating a Canada where the First Nations people would want to be in part of Canada and where they would be involved in the leadership of Canada oh. uh, and where that um, Canadians won't be caretakers of First Nations people, but First Nations people would be caretakers as well of all Canada. And, and the same for Black people. So you have that, 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 that reluctance and that lack of trust. And in the case of the vaccine hesitancy, I think that a significant part of that is the trust. But bear in mind that the hesitancy that you're seeing among Black people is true not only in Canada and the United States, but throughout the Caribbean. I, I, I follow um, what is happening in the Caribbean, and I see that the same governments in the Caribbean that are pushing for upgraded relationships between Africa and the Caribbean, uh, who have now started to institutionalize annual meetings between the African Union and the CARICOM, the Caribbean, and talking about airline links and trading links and, 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 and people from Africa moving to the Caribbean to places like Guyana and elsewhere and helping to populate those countries. Why do you see that? At the same time, we're saying those same governments are having a hard time convincing that citizen to take the vaccine. And much of the argument against the vaccine come out of the misinformation that is spread in North America, and which unfortunately, in an environment of mistrust, find some people who latch onto it. Yeah. And all of those things come together and I think lead to the point where many people are hesitant because they think they are acting out of their best interest, but they're probably doing it with misinformation. 
Yeah. And some people are hesitant simply because they're not willing to trust anybody. Yes. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things. But my hope is that science would somehow be given a chance to show that it is not biased towards one group or the other, and that we can perhaps have some trust in science and, uh, and that we'll be able to overcome that kind of hesitancy. Wise, wise words from you. Thank you. So my last question is, what do you do for self-care? What do I do for self-care? Uh, I try to spend time with my with my kids and my grandkids, I am in the fortunate position where I have now 12 grandkids. Wow. And uh, each opportunity I get, <laughs> thank you. I, I feel truly blessed, um, blessed. And you know the kind of person that I am. I always like kids. I, li I love your son, champion, yes. as I call him when I first met him. <laughs> and uh, my wife, Sharon, and I, each opportunity we get, we are in Toronto. And each time we are in Toronto, that is a, an excuse for our a family reunion and we get together and spend quality time with each other. But in doing that, I am hoping that I am passing on something that is wholesome to not only my kids, but to my grandkids, that family and some elements of tribalism matter mm -hmm. and that they can be proud of themselves and that they can find sustenance among themselves and that they can turn to themselves when they need healing, when they need affirmation, and that while the wider society can be hostile and harsh for them, that family provide them a refuge. So those are the kinds of things that I try to do. And then out of that, I spend time in various communities. I do a lot of talking. And those are the kind of things I do for self-care. And, uh, and occasionally when I can get as much sleep as I can. <laughs>